president of the Regents of the Student People of Poland and the Antioch Student Ministry of the Yes. <laughs> so we wanted to make sure he got his full helping of his costume. I understand. I thought maybe he was home cleaning up. <laughs> I'm going to say that won't happen. But last time he bought beef stew. For, I don't know why he wants to give me a break all of a sudden. I think because I'm not making food he likes. So he bought um, beef stew from Simon's, and today he made his own pasta. So he did buy meatballs from that. Thank you. Okay. We are in the Book of the Twelve, the Twelve Minor Prophets. We started last week and we did Obadiah. And this week we're going into Joel. We'll see how far we get. Joel? He's in there, I promise. Yeah, he's only a, a three, only three chapters long. Obadiah. It's like that song. Obadiah. It's right after Joel's right after Hosea. So if you find Hosea, the next book of Yeah, if you if if you get to Hosea, it's the next book. If you get to Amos, you've gone too far. What's in the New Testament? Well, you're, you are going to find lots of Joel in the New Testament, but not the whole book. Okay, if I can find it here on my computer. There. Okay, good. All right, Joel, let's begin with prayer. Lord God, we give you thanks for gathering us together tonight to study your word. We ask you, Lord, that you would open our hearts and our minds so that we might not only hear your word, but that we might be able to apply it rightly to our lives. This we ask in your name. Amen. All right, so the date and the scene of Joel. Uh, traditionally, it has been held that the book was written in the 9th century B.C., uh, the 800s. Uh, the message is not changed by the dating, whether it's first or less, it's sort of like Obadiah. We don't know absolutely for certain. Uh, some people think it was towards the end. Some people think it's towards the middle. I'm towards the front. Uh, but we're going to treat it like it's towards the front. Like we picked Obadiah as the first one. Uh, we're picking Joel as the second. So we're trying to do these chronologically, uh, and they don't always cooperate with us, uh, to giving real close dates. Uh, there, are, there is no known Joel in the uh, Old Testament, uh, so we don't know who he is. Uh, it's, a, uh, it, it's a prophecy about the coming of the, of the Spirit, and so you'll hear him called the Pentecost prophet, uh, largely because... Uh, what was the text that the sermon was based on that Peter preached in Acts? It was based on Joel, okay? Uh, and so remember the, the New Testament preachers, they didn't have a New Testament, <laughs> right? And they were busy writing it. So, uh, so, they had to, so they preached on the Old Testament. Everything Jesus preached on is on the Old Testament. Everything Paul, Peter, they all preached on the Old Testament. Uh, they might have made references to uh, things that showed up in the gospel, but their texts were the Old Testament. So uh, that's one reason why the Old Testament is so important, is uh, because it is the text on which all the sermons of the New Testament are based. Um, let's see, there's three very significant things about Joel's writing. One, Joel is a classical statement of the eschatological component of all history and nature. Okay. Eschatological. That's your that's your twelve dollar word for the night. Uh, eschatological. E S. Let me find it. Let me find. So I spell it right. E S. No. E S C A. C H A. E S C H A. T O. Logical. Yeah. Eschatological. The eschaton is the end times. Okay. Uh, so the es eschatological is study of the end times. And so that's what you can use with your friends and family is you can talk about, how do you think that really plays into the es eschatological statements in Joel? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you work. You have to work on it so you don't fumble it. Yeah. yeah. 
The, the, so Joel, I'll say it again now, we've got eschatological under, under control. Joel is a classical statement of the eschatological component of all history and nature. What that means is everything points to the end. Okay? Everything points to the end. That's why we, uh, we don't have to get all excited when there's an earthquake. Oh, it might be the end times. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Let me just solve that for you. It is. Because it all points to the end. This is where we're ending. We're not beginning. We're ending. And that's a hard, con it's easy. The older you get, the easier it gets. Okay? I think, anyway, um, from what I've seen uh, with people, the closer you get to death, the more you embrace it as a Christian. As a non-Christian, it's a terribly frightening prospect. Uh, it's horrible, horrible to, to, to be with a non-Christian at their death. Uh, it was the worst. I mean, the chaplains would do rock, paper, scissors when we were called to a, a deathbed and it was a non-Christian. Uh, I mean, particularly with no faith. You know, if they're Buddhists or Hindu or something like that, they have some, something that they believe. But when you have no faith and you've lived your life worshiping something other than uh, a god, it's a horrible place, especially if you've worshipped money. Oh, man, do rich people get mad about dying. They do, because they've always... Yeah, they've all, well, they've always been able to accomplish everything with money. You know, you can, there's, everything has a price. And, and when, they, when, when they face death, they very, and if they have no faith... Uh, that's the key. I mean, I, that's what I'm talking about. Not rich people in general, but rich people who have no faith, who have put their confidence in money, suffer terribly. It's awful. I hate it. Uh, just, it's just, I hate, I hate, it. I mean, and, and there's nothing you can do, you know, because it's too late for them. You know, they're, they're not going to, there's very few real, real, honest, goodness, deathbed confessions. You'll see a few where every once in a while someone turns to God at the last minute. Uh, although my grandmother, who was devout Southern Baptist, and her neighbor, uh, who was a absolutely flagrant playboy his whole life, went through, I mean, the, n never could have been a funnier neighbor to be next door to my grandmother. But he had about three wives. He, you know, bought an MG. He had, you know, had an affair with a secretary, drank too much, smoked, did everything she was sure was going to send you to hell. And when he was dying... The, the local Methodist pastor who knew him some other, I think maybe through a community thing, or like a Rotary Club or something like that, went to see him in the hospital and he confessed Christ and talked about how you know, he realized that he had, he had squandered his whole life, wished he could do it over again, blah, blah, blah. And the, the Methodist pastor was very excited about this and was telling my grandmother, who he happened to know because everyone knew her in the town, and my grandfather had been the pastor there at First Baptist for a long time. And my grandmother's comment was, I'd hate to meet my Lord with so little preparation. <laughs> she just couldn't quite deal with the fact that he had had all that fun <laughs> and waited to the very end <laughs> to straighten up, you know. Um, so anyway, uh, eschatological nature of the book means Joel wants you to understand that everything points to the end. Uh, don't get excited about minor uh, setbacks. And what Joel's going to talk about is really, I mean, I say that with tongue in cheek, minor setback, because he's talking about a locust invasion, uh, which was not minor. But he treats it like it is, because it's just, we're on our way to the end. Don't worry about it. Uh, number two, Joel highlights the sacramental component of all history and nature. Okay, sacrament, the sacramental component. Sacrament is how God comes to us. Okay, not how we go to God. Okay, but how God how God comes to us. Uh, sacrifice is how we go to God. We sacrifice our money. We sacrifice our time. We sacrifice our prayers. We sacrifice whatever it is we give of ourselves to God. That's a sacrifice. Sacrament is when God comes to us, and that's primarily in uh, water and word, right? And 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 uh, body and blood. Water and word and body and blood. That God comes to us in his word. He comes to us in holy baptism. He comes to us through the body and blood of Christ. Okay? But Joel wants you to understand that uh, what, what, you're, what you're praying for 
at all times, as you make your way towards the eschaton, right, what you're praying for is God to come to you. Uh, that God will in, into your life. Okay? And then finally, Joel features the Holy Spirit. One of the few Old Testament prophets who talks, uh, that really features the Holy Spirit, really says anything about the Spirit. Uh, he, he features the Holy Spirit as the Lord and giver of life, the agent through whom via word and sacrament, law and gospel, Zion is being established. Okay, what's Zion? Yeah, Zion is heaven, right? The city of Jerusalem sits on top of Mount Zion. Okay, so Zion's uh, what we talk about, the pro it's our promised land. It's where we're going. It's what we're looking forward to. Uh, nothing in this world is what we want. Uh, everything in this world is what we have for now. And, uh, and God gives us those, these nice little moments uh, to kind of get us through the day uh, because he knows without those it would be too much for us. So he gives us these little oases as we go along through life. But we always know, no matter what the oasis is, we know that the other shoe is going to drop. Okay, Sooner or later, something's going to happen. Something's going to fall apart. Something's going to unravel. It's the way of the world. That's the way it is. And you can, you can uh, believe in all the sweetness and light you want to believe in. But it ain't true. And, uh, and God, God affirms that. It ain't true. The, the Garden of Eden was shut down, locked away, had an angel with a flaming sword posted at the gate. <laughs> it, you're not in it. Uh, and it's, it's really, uh, there's, there, there's an, uh, uh, an amazing number of, of uh, believing people, Christians, uh, who just don't want to believe that. They still, to this day, want to believe that if you just get all your ducks in a row, everything will be perfect. You know, you just have to get every. All your, and we really thought that had gone away uh, because that was that was what was uh, real popular at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, you know, the Great Revival, uh, which happened in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Billy Sunday, the tent meetings. All that this whole concept was, if, if you people will just straighten up your lives and, and get right with God, then everything's going to be fantastic. And you went, we went through the gay 90s and, uh, and then the and turn of the century and everything was going great and things were going better and better and better and people were getting richer and richer and richer and then World War I came. Yep. And that was a little bit of a blip. And then right on its heels, the Great Depression. And then right on its heels, World War II. I don't think God could have been clearer. This world is unraveling, you bunch of Dorcases. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the dorks. Yeah, the world's unraveling. If you think the world's getting better and better and better, stick a carton of cottage cheese in the back of your refrigerator and check it in about three months. See if it's developed into a higher life form. You know, this is dumb. But this is really what people believed then. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of evangelicals who still buy into that. If you just get your life straightened out, God will bless you. That is exactly what some of the TV preachers and the radio preachers preach. I was just going to say the TV evangelists, yeah. maybe yeah. in the 80s, there were just... Oh, oh now! Yeah. Well, wow. I was yeah. watching something on the 80s on uh, History Channel. Oh, yeah. And it had, you know, Tammy Faye Baker. And, uh, mm -hmm. It was always, you know, send your money. And, you yeah. Know, but you're right there, are they there now. Like, Although I still say <laughs> that if that one guy in Mississippi's congregation can buy him a Learjet, you guys could at least buy me an Escalade. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> come on. <laughs> yeah. I gave up on the hot tub. <laughs> <laughs> I've moved on to the Escalade now. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, this, the, there's still this concept, you know, that if you just get, if, if we do everything right, and you'll even hear people say things like that. Uh, you know, I, 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 I haven't had a school in a long time now, but, you know, for my first 15 years I had a school, and I heard so many parents, when their children did something really bad, I heard so many parents say, I don't understand it. We did everything right. 
And I just about choked every time they said that because it was like, no, what, folks, are you crazy? You know, we parent the best we can. We don't know if we're right. We do what we think. We, we, we follow the scriptures to the best of our ability if, if you, you bother the scriptures. Uh, and that was another thing is that, you know, as I've said before, as a 26-year-old pastor, uh, you know, with, with no kids, who's only been married for a few years, and you're given advice and on how to raise kids. And it, it, was, it was tough, but then I realized finally, well, I, I, I didn't just realize it out of the blue, uh, Luther Engelbrecht helped me. He was an old veteran pastor who's now with the Lord. Uh, but uh, Luther, Luther was, uh, was somebody who I could go to. Uh, he wasn't like-minded with me. He was very, very different from me on theological issues and all, but he was very happy to share his years in the saddle. And uh, one of the things he said is, God's word, d does that change with each parent? And I said, no, you know, God's word doesn't change. He says, exactly. God's word is God's word. He said, it doesn't matter if you're 26 or, or 86. God's word is God's word. So if you're preaching God's word, you're fine. And let them mock and gripe and complain all they want. You know, but that's what it is. And then, I mean, I yeah. Single, I mean, so single, but I mean, it was single that and parents said, you don't know what you're talking about. You haven't had kids. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. God's word is God's word. <laughs> it's not hard. You know, this is what God expects of, of, of his children. And it doesn't matter how old you are, it doesn't matter what station of life you're in, uh, if you bother to look at it, and that's, that's the hard thing, right? Is that the, the, the difficult thing about God's word is that you have to open the Bible and read it. And that is difficult. I mean, I'm not, I'm not making fun of that, it, it is. It's not like a, a, a novel of your, by your famous author, uh, your favorite author. Uh, it's it, well, I don't, and of course, nowadays, even fewer people than ever even open a book. But it's not like your favorite podcast or your favorite Netflix, you know, show that you binge. It's it's hard. It's like I said Sunday. It's it 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 requires work. It's not easy, but it's re rewarding and it's it's rich if you ever if you ever can just bring yourself to do it. Okay, uh, let's look at Luther on Joel. You should have that in front of you there. Dave, there's a copy on the table there. You didn't, I put the copy there. I knew, you're, I, I knew you were going to be here. I felt your presence. Yeah. This is again out of the study Bible. I've just photocopied it for you out of the study Bible. Uh, Joel was a kindly and gentle man. He does not denounce and rebuke as do the other prophets, but pleads and laments. He tried with kind and friendly words to make the people righteous and to protect them from harm and misfortune. But it happened to him, as to the other prophets, the people did not believe his words and held him to be a fool. Nevertheless, Joel is highly praised in the New Testament, for in Acts 2, St. Peter quotes him. Thus, Joel had to provide the first sermon ever preached in the Christian church the one on Pentecost at Jerusalem, when the Holy Spirit was given. St. Paul, too, makes glorious use of the saying, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved, which is also in Joel. In the first chapter, he prophesies the punishment, which is to come upon the people of Israel. They are to be destroyed and carried away by the Assyrians. And he calls the Assyrians cutting, swarming, hopping, and destroying locusts. For the Assyrians devoured the kingdom of Israel bit by bit until they had completely destroyed it. In the end, however, King Sennacherib had to suffer defeat before Jerusalem. Joel touches on that in chapter 2 when he says, I will remove the northerner far from you. Now Jerusalem in the southern kingdom, remember. In the second place, at the end of the second chapter, and from the point on, that point on, he prophesies of the kingdom of Christ and of the Holy Spirit, and speaks of the everlasting Jerusalem. He speaks of the valley of Jehoshaphat, and says that the Lord will summon all the nations thither for judgment. 
The ancient fathers understand that to refer to the last they understand that to refer to the last judgment. That's the eschaton. I do not condemn this interpretation, but hold nevertheless that this is really Joel's meaning. Even as he calls the Christian church the everlasting Jerusalem, so he calls it also the Valley of Jehoshaphat. He does so because through the word, all, all the world is summoned to the Christian church and is there judged and by the preaching is reproved as being altogether sinners in the sight of God. As Christ says, the spirit of truth will remove the world of sin. For Valley of Jehoshaphat means Valley of Judgment. Thus also does Hosea call the Christian church the Valley of Achor. Okay, so when we get to Valley of Jehoshaphat, that'll make more sense for you. All right, Joel chapter 1. In the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel, Hear this, you elders, give ear, all inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children to another generation. What the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. What the hopping lo locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. Awake, you drunkards! And weep and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the sweet wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up against my land, powerful and beyond number. Its teeth are lion's teeth, and it has the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vine and splintered my fig tree. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it down. Their branches are made white. Lament like a virgin wearing sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. The grain offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn the ministers of the Lord. The fields are destroyed. The ground mourns because the grain is destroyed. The wine dries up. The oil languishes. Be ashamed, O tillers of the soil. Wail, O vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley because of the harvest and the field has perished. The vine dries up, the fig tree languishes. Pomegranate, palm, and apple, all the trees of the field are dried up, and gladness dries up from the children of man. All right. So, first of all, no one knows who Pethuel is. Don't bother. Uh, Joel, uh, maybe it was a real person. Uh, maybe it's uh, based on the Hebrew... Uh, Yahweh, meaning Yahweh is God, okay? Yael, uh, El is God, Yahweh, J-O would be Y-A, and, uh, and then E-L is E-L, and so Yahweh is God. It could be either one. It could be like a pseudonym, and we don't know who wrote it, or it could be a real person named Joel. We just don't know. The destruction of the first swarm of locusts, uh, which could strip a nation of crops in hours, literally hours. A swarm of locusts could strip the nation of, of crops. And remember, this is, a, this is a, uh, a place where this happens. This is not made up. These are not fairy creatures. You know, everybody in Joel's world knows what a locust can do to your crop. Uh, and of course, even as, as recently as the last uh, century in this country, uh, locusts could bring devastation to large areas. Uh, the difference, of course, is, is that remember how small Israel is. So a swarm of locusts could devastate the entire nation. You know, where in this country, it could devastate a large area, but there was always other, other areas. There were always other areas that could you know, provide the food, uh, even when the one area got devastated by locusts. Uh, so this, a swarm of locusts could plunge the whole country into famine. Right? So it's important uh, to understand these locusts, you know, what, what this means. I mean, these, this is a vivid image. Uh, the different locusts there uh, that he names uh, might be actual locusts. We don't know if he's uh, making references here to these uh, armies of Assyria, or if these are really, uh, I mean, there are cutting locusts, uh, swarming locusts. They, they, they're, when they get old enough, they grow wings and can take full flight. 
A hopping locust, before they get their wings, they hop around on the ground, they're immature. Um, so, you know, who knows if they're actual types of locusts there uh, that he's talking about. Uh, certainly, the, uh, there, there's some, there are some great medieval paintings of the locusts with lion's teeth and, and you know, the things like that that, uh, that he talks about here. Uh, they, everything here is strip bark. That's what they do. Kills everything. Uh, lament like a virgin wearing sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. Um, so, any questions there? Maybe he was turning um, grasshoppers into locusts. What's that? I said maybe he was turning grasshoppers into locusts too, because grasshoppers can eat a few of them too. Right. No, the, 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 now, what, from what I know, in the Middle East at this time, yeah, they were. They, these are these are um, different from grasshoppers um, because they're so. And, and and the difference is, I think these are bigger uh, creatures uh, than grasshoppers, and I think they devastate faster and more. From what I remember of my you know training and when I was taking the Old Testament T prophets. Um, yeah. Sort of plagues too, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, plagues of locusts, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Um, yeah, and so they would have that that would have maybe called some things to mind too for them, right? Uh, if they heard that, I would think so. Anyway, uh, let's see. One verses begin at verse thirteen. Put on sackcloth and lament. Remember, you know what sackcloth is, right? It's the rough stuff that they wore for mourning. Uh, yeah, it's kind of like burlap. Yeah, put on sackcloth and lament. Oh, that reminds me. One of my favorite stories, I love telling this to confirmation kids uh, because they, they get so grossed out by it. In the early church, when, during the days of Lent, new believers would put on sackcloth on Ash Wednesday and pour ashes over their head. But they didn't go home and take a bath. They lived without changing that sackcloth for 40 days. And... and so, I mean, they would pour ashes over their head every day. They would, these were all signs of repentance. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that is, it's a, such a cool imagery of 40 days of this. Think how gross and dirty and oily and disgusting. I mean, this is Middle East. It's hot, you know. Mm -hmm. Think how disgusting those people were. Not what we think of on, on New Member Sunday, right? Yeah. <laughs> All these disgusting people. Well, then what they would do, they, they, they've, and I don't know if every church had this, but in some of the big cathedrals anyway, what they would do is they had baptistries. And the baptistries were where the baptismal font was. Now remember, in the early, in the cathedral era of the church, so 300 to, um, I don't know, 700, something like that, AD, um, after the legalization of Christianity, because before this it was all underground. We don't know quite what they did, but uh, but after this was when they could do all the pageantry and all the stuff like that. So they had these baptistries built, and they were uh, big uh, hot tub type affairs. You know, they weren't like little twelve ounce porcelain bowls like we use, or little enamel mixing bowls. You know, they were these huge affairs that people literally walked into. So. They've unearthed some, some, some of the archaeology shows that they had this divided, uh, this anti-room divided in two, men on one side, women on the other, because you were baptized naked. Mm -hmm. You took off your sackcloth. Can you imagine how good that would feel to take that <laughs> off after wearing it for 40 days? I mean, just think of what, how good it feels to take off your clothes in the, in, at the end of a day when you've just been wearing them for one day doing something difficult, you know, working in the yard or whatever, how good it feels to strip off those dirty, sweaty clothes. Think of a sackcloth for 40 days, and there's no light in this little room, okay? And so they have uh, maybe a couple candles, you know, just so you don't run into each other. And so you're standing, you take off the sackcloth, you're standing nude in this little tiny room, and then first one group, then the other group, you go into the baptistry and literally wash for the first time in 40 days. And the priest pours water over your head in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And you probably swim around a little bit and you know do your hair and whatever, I don't know. And, uh, and then you get out and then they pour oil over your head, sweet smelling, beautifully scented oil. 
So for the first time in 40 days, you smell good. And the cool thing about the baptistry is, is they think, uh, it, that at least in some of the places, that the wall, the, they always faced east because everything, you know, the altar always faced east. And uh, the wall was all done, in, they think, in some kind of stained glass. And so remember, you went into the baptistry, this is where the uh, history of the sun, sunrise service comes. You went into the baptistry prior to sunrise, it was dark. You go to the dark baptistry, you take off your dirty, nasty sackcloth, you walk into the, the, the baptismal room with the morning light streaming through the beautiful glass, uh, stained glass, and, and then you have the tub, and you get baptized, you have oil, and then they take a linen, a new clean linen gown and put it on you, and then you march into the into the church for on Easter. This is on Easter Sunday. It's what they did during the Easter vigil, and they're singing. You know, I don't know whatever they sang on Easter morning back then. Probably not crown him with many crowns, but uh, uh, I don't think it was written yet. But uh, but think, I mean, think of the imagery there, of of going from dirty sackcloth, clean, f smelling good smelling oil, fresh linen gown into the worship service the singing, the beautiful light coming in through the windows. What a cool imagery for baptism. You know, just amazing to think of that. Now um, it's full of the garden on which chocolate syrup poured out of the Well, we can't all be that cool. That was from a youth trip. Uh, well, this guy, we went to this pan, it was a pan Christian group, okay? And so you never know what you're going to get. It's a box of chocolates. And I've, I have found over many, many years of doing this that it's useful to let kids see what other groups teach and then debrief them because they're going to be exposed to false theology in the world. I love to be in the room when it happens so that I can debrief them on it. Uh, and, 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 and conversely, when they get it right, you know, sing their praises, uh, and, because they do get it right uh, frequently. Uh, but this time he had, he was trying to describe baptism and he had this garden gnome and he was talking about sin and he was covering it with chocolate syrup, dripping all down the garden. And I'm thinking, not bad. Sin, chocolate syrup, sticky, gooey. I mean, I, chocolate syrup, I'd probably use tar, but you know, I don't, something that's tasty, I'm not sure I would, but oh, whatever, you know, he's on the right track, this is great. Um, and, and now he's gonna get to the end, it's gonna have a gnome covered chocolate syrup, and he's gonna dump it in some hot soapy water down there and talk about being baptized and how he's gonna come out all clean, no. Now we had to talk about, take the washcloth and dip it in the water and talk about how we work to clean all that off and how baptism gives us the power to clean ourselves. And I'm like, no, I want to stand up and say, you almost got there. <laughs> oh, you know, put your Calvinism away for five minutes. You know, you almost got there. You know, and this is the thing. They read the Bible and they know, but they just can't let go of their part that they play. It's just, it, they just get right to the edge of saying, and then God washes you clean of all your sin. They can't get that out. And they have to get the washcloth out and say, and then we wipe away the sin by being good people and following the Ten Commandments. And anyway, so. This was at a, a, a youth thing that we went to. We took the kids to. It was a pan, pan Christian gathering, not just Missouri Synod Lutherans. The speaker goes, I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> I wasn't going to identify <laughs> the false theology. <laughs> Is it? Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I, I watch YouTube sermons all the time. Uh, not all the time, but frequently. I turn, I, I watch several, you know, uh, just to see what the other bodies are saying, you know. And over and over and over again, I am just disappointed because they they almost get it, almost get it. Um, did you? I was watching one on um, the miracle of Jesus turning water into wine, uh, and um, the point of that whole miracle was because Jesus wasn't sure whether he should start his ministry or not. But Mary told him, 
that he really, and that, you know how moms are. Mary told him, she gave him the look and she told him, we need to get this started. Oh, no. That was oh. the wedding of Cana, water into wine. I wanted to crawl through the screen and throttle the preacher. You just told an entire congregation of people absolute false theology on top of it being stupid. Okay, just stupid. It's the son of God, for heaven's sakes. He knows when to start his ministry. Woman, what does this have to do with me was not Jesus questioning things. It was him making Mary think. Yeah. You know, it had nothing to do with his question. Like, golly, I don't know. Should I do this or not? <laughs> just the son of God. What am I in this world? Oh, good heavens. This preacher can be thankful that I couldn't get through the screen. Just, did you hear that the, uh, there's an elementary school, it's called Diana's Elementary School, matter of fact, in Moline, who was started as a satanic club. No! Huh? Kelly sent me that information. In Moline? Yes, an after school club. Elementary school. In elementary. In elementary. Well, you know, if you're going to hell, it's good, good to get started early. Yeah. <laughs> What, what kind of games do you have? Yeah. I, I don't know. She had it only had it in the whole thing. Oh. Like well. Probably has fire in it. You know, I I had um, I had uh, in, in you know in Seattle, uh, Satanism is much more prevalent than you find in the Midwest. Um, up on Orcas Island, uh, they have a huge group of Satanists uh, and Wiccan who don't like to be called Satanists. They get real mad at you if you call them Satanists because they're not Satanists, they're witches. It's a whole different thing. Uh, but in my book, it's sort of the same thing. But they probably say the same thing about Lutherans and Baptists, you know, it's probably all the same thing. But anyway, the point is, uh, we had a, uh, uh, what do you call them? Well, a witch, but a, a member of the Wiccan community living next door to the church uh, in in Seattle. And she constantly was complaining about how loud our music was on Sunday mornings, how offensive our signboard was. I can't tell you how many complaints the city of Seattle got from her about us. Uh, when our youth group was out in the parking lot, um, you know, doing playing ball or whatever, shooting baskets, uh, always a complaint about the noise we were making. Uh, just a uh, but I never saw them do any activities over there. But they might have. I don't know. Well, we never. Everything's going at higher level all the time. Yeah. Maybe she. Maybe she did activities and just didn't invite us. I don't think she liked us very much. Uh, Joel one thirteen. A call to repentance. Put on sackcloth. Lament, O priest. Wail, O ministers of the altar. Go in. Pass the night in sackcloth, O ministers of my God. Because grain offering and drink offering are withheld uh, from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders. That's old people there, not pastors. In the New Testament, elders is pastors. But here it's older people. And all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God. And cry out to the Lord. Every time you see Lord there, it's Yahweh. Okay? Alas for the day. For the day of the Lord is near, and as destruction from the Almighty, it comes. Uh, it is, is not the food cut off before your eyes, joy and gladness from the house of God. The seed shrivels under the clods, and storehouses are desolate. The granaries are torn down because the grain has dried up. How the beasts groan. The herds of cattle are perplexed because there's no pasture for them. Even the flocks of sheep suffer. To you, O Lord, I call. For fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. The flame has burned all the trees of the field. Even the beasts of the field pant for you because the water brooks are dried up and the fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. Okay, so... Um, Joel would suggest here that the natural response to disaster would be repentance. Okay? If only people thought that way. What is the natural response to disaster? Well, we have to fix this. Right? Uh, disaster is uh, in our lives. It's, it's just chance, right? Uh, or it's fate. Oh, I'm just fated. Or I was unlucky. 
Uh, bad luck. Uh, how would you answer Joel if a plague of locusts had just devoured your land and he said, repent? Um, I think we have to be, be careful about drawing a hard line between every bad situation and a particular sin. You know, I think we have to be careful about that and not say, oh, well, you're dying of cancer because you smoked. You know, it's, it's God's punishment on you. Or you're dying of AIDS because you're gay. It's your punishment. You know, I think we have to be very, very careful about saying that. Um, however, we also have to be honest about throughout the Bible, God is clear that consequences do come for sinful behavior. Okay? Ongoing sinful behavior brings consequences. Not punishment, but consequences. What's the difference between punishment and consequences? Well, consequences can be natural. They can also be imposed. So if I get a if I get a ticket on the Eisenhower, that's a consequence, but it's not a natural consequence. If I run off the road and flip my car three times because I'm going too fast, that would be a natural consequence. Yeah. So consequences can be imposed. As opposed to a what? Uh, punishment. Punishment. Nope. No, it's a consequence. Yeah. Punishment is evil for evil. Okay, You do evil to me, I do evil to you. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You get what you do dole out. Don't get mad, get even. Yeah, don't get mad, get even. You know, you know who says that? God. God says, I didn't get mad, I got even. How do you get even? Punish two. Which one? Who did God punish? Sometimes the answer really is Jesus. <laughs> Jesus? Yeah. Yeah. Jesus took our punishment. God got even. He had to get even. Why does he have to get even? Because he's just. Okay, he can't let a debt go. He can't. It's not a matter of him not being a nice guy. He can't. It's one of his attributes. He has to be perfectly just. We ran up a debt of sin. It had to be paid off. The only way that it could be paid off uh, for all of us was with himself. He himself had to pay off our sin for us. He did it by punishing Jesus on the cross. Now that Jesus had been punished on the cross, he didn't punish anybody. Okay. There's never punishment from God. Only discipline or consequences. Discipline is the better word. You don't punish your children, you discipline them. Okay. Punishment would indicate uh, you did something wrong, so I'm going to do something bad to you. Okay. Discipline is... You did something wrong, so I'm going to try to figure out a way to teach you how not to do that again or, or how to think through something before you do that again. And, of course, no parent's perfect, so sometimes we screw up and we give crappy you know, discipline, but we do our best. Yeah? So this locust, mm -hmm. that's punishment. Mm -hmm. oh. No, why, it, why did the locust... Okay, first of all, what do the, what do the locusts probably represent for, for the people? Who's going to come and devour Israel like locusts? Oh. The Assyrians, right. Oh, so they're not actually going to get attacked by locusts. Well, they might. I mean, it might be that too. I mean, there may have been a locust plague that Joel is comparing to and saying, you think that's bad? Wait till you see what's coming. Okay. Well, that's the eschaton. Yeah, that's the end of times. That's the, the, the foreshadowing is all, Joel's always pointing towards, remember when prophets talk, it's like they, have you ever been to a mountain range? You know, have you ever seen a range of mountains, whether the Smokies or the Rockies or the Cascades or whatever? And, and when you look down the range, like uh, what I think of is I go to, if you go to Mount Baker and you look south, 
you see Mount Rainier, you see the two sisters, you sometimes on a good day can see all the way down to Mount Hood, okay? And you can see forever, all these mountains, and the further away it goes, the foggier it gets. That's how prophets see. They see what's going to happen next. So there may have been a locust plague coming, okay? But, bef but after that, the, the, what, wait till you watch out for Assyria, okay? And then finally, that last mountain down there, that's the eschaton. That's the end times, the last day. When, when everybody who has rejected God is going to be consumed like locusts, consume your field. There's no, yo, Jesus, yeah, John says in, in the gospel according to Luke two weeks ago that Jesus has got his winnowing fork and he separates the chaff from the wheat and he gathers the wheat into his barn and what happens to the chaff? Burned with unquenchable fire. None of the happy clappy churches like that text. That's not a fun text. Hey, burn with a, I, it really hurts me not to preach on it too. I mean, I was going a different direction on that day, but when it, when, how can you pass up burn with unquenchable fire? What a great line, you know? That's what it's going to be. Yeah. Okay, that's what it's going to be for people who reject Christ. Well, okay. line about fire, um, filled with fire and gnashing teeth. Yeah, that's another good one. <laughs> that one's just Where the worm does not die. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so Joel is telling them if you don't straighten up, there's going to be consequences. God's finally going to say, okay, enough. And the Assyrians are coming. Okay. And, the, and, and they kept on and on and on, ignoring God, rejecting him, pushing him away. Uh, that's why I say that, that when it comes to damnation, eventually God says, okay, your will be done. You know, he won't drag us kicking and screaming into heaven. The people of God had gotten to that point where they were completely rejecting him. And so the Assyrians came like a swarm of locusts. Is that punishment? No. It's consequences. Because guess who was watching? The southern kingdom. Now you would have thought... When, when Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, got to Jerusalem and was able to get beaten back somehow, which was ridiculous because the little kingdom of Judah was nothing against the kingdom of Assyria. But it happened. You know, Judah was preserved. Uh, and why did Judah have to be preserved? Because through Judah comes Jesus, right? So Judah had to be preserved. So it gets down to the little kingdom of Judah. You would have thought they would have said, holy mackerel. All right. No more of this, you know, idolatry stuff. No more of this worshiping at false temples. No more of this, you know, doing whatever we want to do because we're the people of God. We can just, you know, we've got a free pass for anything. Uh, no, didn't work. They still kept on and on and on. And it has not stopped yet. The people of God still struggle with this concept that the only thing that matters is the worship of God. The only thing that matters is the worship of God. Everything in our lives points to the worship of God. And whatever we have in our lives that isn't pointing towards the worship and glory of God needs to be cut off. Hence the great text, you know, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. If your hand offends you, cut it off. Better to enter paradise maimed than to spend eternity in hell uh, with two hands or two feet or two eyes. You know, that's the great text there for that. We still have not quite figured it out that everything that offends God, get rid of it, okay? Just get rid of it. Um, let's see. The point there being, we, we still struggle with the same thing that Joel struggles with. Uh, we still struggle with people saying uh, utterly, and, and some people are nicer about it than others. I'm not. Uh, but they're just utterly stupid things. Like, boy, was I lucky. Okay. Uh, well, you can't. I mean, it's just, that's just fate. I don't know. Just fate. Just the way it happens. There's no such thing as fate or luck. 
you either believe you're in the hands of God or you don't. Okay? If you don't, I'm sorry. I feel bad for you. But at some point, we got to... I don't know how to... Um, I don't know how to be sensitive to everybody's feelings and say the truth at the same time always. You know? The truth has to be proclaimed. Uh, and the truth is, is that God's in control. We're in his hands. Uh, and we need to stop worrying about anything that isn't, uh, that isn't focused around that concept. You know what I'm saying? And we need to stop wringing our hands over CNN. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who cares? You know, well, we can say the same thing about Fox News. You know, I mean, I'm an equal opportunity destroyer of media. Yeah, I, it's all a bunch of nonsense. Instead of saying, I'm lucky, we should say I'm blessed. Blessed or fortunate. Fortunate. Yeah. Fortunate. Yeah, fortunate's a good word. Blessed it's is a so good word. get the word lucky out of yeah. vocabulary. Yeah, get it out. I didn't know if fortunate meant the same thing as lucky. Yeah, yeah. blessed by God, fortunate, smiled upon by God. Fortunate yeah. And we are, and it's not cocky or arrogant to say that. No, I use fortunate as an awful lot. Yeah. Well, I mean, as long you could, you're right that it could be seen as the same thing as the, the fortune is smiling on me or the fates are smiling on me. But if you understand that fortunate means one who is who who has their fortunes because of God, you know, one is a steward of God. So I use I, I prefer blessed, but it makes me sound like a Baptist. You know, so you know, I don't know. It does get like it's so redundant, but there isn't any other word equal to blessed. It really is. Yeah, it's it's makorios is the is the Greek word in in and uh, you know it's in the Beatitudes. You know, blessed are they, uh, and and fortunate is a good translation of makorios. Um, you know, but it's it is what it is. You know, it's it's not. There's the, the, anything that would lead you to believe that there's some force outside of God that's guiding your life, okay, uh, is what you want to get away from. And I don't know always how to, how to because people are so committed to their uh, idolatry of luck. Uh, the, the way people will argue with me about playing the lottery. You know, I just... I'm, it, it's, I, oh, I don't care. I don't think it, you're a horrible, vile sinner if you play the lottery. You know, I've been known to buy a scratch-off ticket now and again because it's kind of fun, you know, to scratch off the little numbers. And I don't play the, 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 the multi-billion dollar thing because I, I think that God probably has preserved me from being a multi-billionaire because I would probably destroy my life and a lot of lives around me. Uh, I think if he wanted me to have that, he, he would have given it to me. But, you know, it's fun to win $5 or $10 or something like that. I, I don't have a problem with that. I don't curse people, uh, you know, damnation because they do that. But please, can we re recognize that it's stupid? Okay? It's just a stupid use of money from a, from a fiscal stewardship point of view. Okay? Uh, if you enjoy playing the slots now and then, I don't care. I, you know, that's fine. That's, uh, to, in my mind, it's the same as eating a Big Mac. You know, that's a stupid use of calories. <laughs> You know, and it's bad for your body or smoking a cigar or, you know, whatever. You know, there's there's all kinds of stupid things that we do that the Lord kind of says, oh, shakes his head and says, all right, fine, you know, puts up with it. But it's one thing to do a stupid, you know, have a stupid stupidity once in a while and another thing to build your life around it mm -hmm. and defend it, mm -hmm. you know, as though you're your kingdom of stupidities and, and be angry at anybody who, who points out your stupidities. Even if they can biblically point them out and say, look, this is what the scriptures say. You know, you're arguing with God, not me. Doesn't matter. Because they can go find some charlatan to tell them what they want to hear. That's the bottom line. Is there's a lot of charlatans out there who will tell them what they want to hear. Well, last night on Wheel of Fortune, a lady won a car. And when she was in the car, she was pointing up at God. Mm -hmm. I'm okay. Is that like... Is that a blessing that she won the I don't know. I'm trying to figure that well, out. Well, I mean, gambling. certainly God gave her the abilities that she used to win the game to yeah, get the car. she wasn't gambling. She was, yeah. like, kind of earned it in a way. Well, I mean, there's, that's no different than a, than a sports figure who does really well and, and gives credit to God. Right. Yeah. And, and yeah. And maybe she needed the car for herself or family members. I always just wonder when I... 
I wouldn't be offended by it. Yeah, I don't think that, as long as she tithed. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I had a, a, a parishioner one time uh, at another church who won uh, a big payoff in the lottery and came to me and asked me if, if uh, hey, hey, we're almost done. Have a seat. You might, you might uh, be able to add to our, our collective ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> or even solve it, maybe. Um, Anyway, uh, oh, I know, he won a big pay on the lottery and came in and talked to me about it because he was concerned. I mean, he'd been part of this lottery pool for years and years and years and years, and no one had ever won anything, and he just did it because everybody at work did it, you know, and and he ended up winning $7 million. Wow. And, uh, and like, well, what do I do now? <laughs> and I said, well, <laughs> I said, you know, I said, you don't, if you, you, you don't need to change your life. There's nothing about your life that you need to change. So use it. And he did. And he, uh, it was really funny because one of his kids came in and complained to me one time about, what did you tell my dad? <laughs> I said, about what? About the money. As I told him to use it for God's glory. Find, figure out a way to use it for God's glory. Well, we just went uh, on this vacation that they went on all the time, and he says, uh, "We stay at the Motel Six again." <laughs> he wouldn't. He didn't change anything. <laughs> Nothing, uh, because he determined to use all of that money. He gave all that money over the years. Uh, I assume he gave it all away. I, I left before before I knew, but he every year he would sit down and decide how, who he was going to give it to, and he supported all kinds of charitable institutions. I don't think he used a dime of it for himself. Yeah. I mean, what? and that's the kind of person that, that you would say, God blessed. <laughs> because he, he uh, it didn't disrupt his life. And that's always the, the danger is that large amounts of money disrupt lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah, only thing it did was tick off his kid, which was kind of funny, so. You know, the kid didn't know his dad bought the small cell Yeah, no. <laughs> No, to his, I bet you to his dying day, he stayed at the Motel 6, because that was good enough. It was a bed, it was a TV, it was a bathroom. What more do you need? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. I don't think he drives anymore, but yeah. All right, so next week we'll pick up with Chapter 2. Uh, next week is what? One... Uh, 18725. All right, let's close with the blessing. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. The Lord that have his countenance upon us and give us peace. Amen. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I talked to Dina. They are over the, the vid or the Rona or whatever. Oh, no, she was online. There she is. She's checking in. Uh, so they were working, they were watching from home tonight. And Danya says hello too. I didn't check any of the comments because I was on the. Is Sarah online? Uh, Sarah is working. Um, let me think. Uh, 